Technology. Science. Space. Environment. People. Places. It's all totally awesome. Welcome once again to Totally Awesome. Today we're devoting the whole show to animals. The weird and wonderful, large and small, cute and cuddly, and of course, endangered animals from around the world. So sit back and enjoy the amazing stories that could help save some of these precious creatures today on Totally Awesome. From the centre of a major city, this reserve has become a nursery for the water vole. If you've ever read Kenneth Graham's Wind in the Willows, you may recognise the vole as a character ratty in the story. The tiny mammal was once numbered in the hundreds of millions across the UK. Now their numbers have been reduced to less than one million. Well, in a last ditched attempt to save the water vole, more than 200 are being released onto a suburban wetland reserve where it's hoped they'll go forth and multiply. A team of conservationists have come together and with the help of £10,000 in funds have embarked on a project to save the vole. They are slowly releasing about 100 of the furry creatures onto the wetland in the largest reintroduction scheme ever attempted with the species. Each vole has been fitted with a radio tracking collar so that it can be located and monitored. The biggest threat the vole has to face is the American mink. It takes over the vole's burrow, giving the vole nowhere to go and at a greater risk of other predators. There are areas where the vole and the mink coexist. Conservationists are keen to learn more about how the two can live together. They believe that by doing so, this threatened species may stand a better chance of survival. We promised cute, take a look at this little girl. Tana, an African elephant, was born at the Berlin Zoo in May and has been attracting a huge audience ever since. Zookeepers were initially concerned that the calf's mother, 20-year-old Pori, might reject her firstborn. But according to zoo officials, the mother has become accustomed to the new situation and is doing a fine job in raising little Tana. Elephants are very sociable animals. It's hard to believe that this cute little one will be that big and heavy one day. Unfortunately, the African elephant is on the endangered species list, mainly due to the ivory trade. Ivory comes from the elephant's tusks and has been made into jewellery, fishing hooks and knife handles, among other things. The government has banned the trading of ivory. However, there is always someone willing to buy products and poachers go to work to supply goods. While little Tana is safe here with her mother, under the watchful eye of zookeepers, it's the plight of her species that should be catching the crowd's attention. Hopefully the awareness she is bringing will be enough to change people's attitudes. It must have been a busy day for the storks, because on the same day Tana was born, so was Alban, a male dwarf hippopotamus. After being pregnant for 173 days, his 13-year-old mother, Aeanus, gave birth to the two-kilogram baby. Alban has since gained about half a kilogram each day. Dwarf hippopotami, whose natural home is the forests of West Africa, are also a rare and endangered species due to the destruction of its habitat. Fortunately, there are a number of natural parks on the Ivory Coast and Guinea where the hippo enjoys protection. The dwarf or pygmy hippo has some unique features like the fact that it can close its nose and ears underwater. He is a water dweller and in the sun loses water through the skin very quickly, about five times as fast as humans. The little hippos are very shy animals preferring to live alone. By the time he is five months old he will weigh ten times as much as he did when he was born. That sure makes him a bouncing baby boy. Yeah. 
It wouldn't be unusual for you to ask, what is it? Or why does this animal look so bizarre? This rather strange looking animal is an okapi, a relative of the giraffe, and is only found in the Democratic Republic of Congo. With its gentle eyes and zebra markings, this unusual animal was only discovered at the beginning of the century. Some say because it's so shy and secretive. A wildlife reserve which spreads out for almost 14,000 square kilometres and named after the Okapi was established in 1992 to try and protect the natural riches in the forest. With a population of around 30,000 animals, this is the last remaining natural habitat for the Okapis in the world. For years there's been a breeding station for captive Okapis here at Epilu. They live in large shady enclosures fed by the local Bambuti pygmies. The breeding program has been put on hold until the war in the area comes to an end. The pygmies trek daily to the nearby forest to collect a variety of leaves for the Okapis. These are then washed and hung on the line. It's an exercise that's repeated twice a day. According to park officials, before the Congo Wars began in 1996, the main problem in the park was the poaching of elephants for their ivory and other small animals for food. Now there's an even bigger problem with the discovery of Colombo tantalite, or coltane. Coltane is a type of ore. The tantalum, which comes from the coltane, is used in mobile phones, computer chips and stereos. Earlier this year, the park was invaded by thousands of illegal miners seeking fortunes. To try and solve the invasion, the park officials asked the rebel armies in the area to help protect the rare flora and fauna of the park. The rebels offered to train and arm rangers to patrol the park, but with less than 60 trained and not very well equipped guards to protect the massive areas of the park reserve, there's still little that the wildlife authority in Ipalu can do to prevent the poaching. And it's not only the soldiers poaching for bushmeat and ivory who are killing the animals. The miners who flooded into the forest last year also need to eat, adding to the guards' problems. Deep in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, a guard on patrol searches an old rundown house for signs of life. It's an old mining camp and indicates that people have been illegally digging for coltane. The camp is empty, but earlier this year more than 500 miners worked here, panning frantically for coltane in the nearby forest streams. They cut down trees for houses, destroyed the streams and tore off tree bark to sieve the coltane from the water. The trees without their bark are now dying. Further on, a patrol finds a group of miners quietly at work. These are local farmers hoping for quick riches. Caught by the guards, their equipment is confiscated and they're led off to jail at the Wildlife Reserve headquarters. According to the rangers, the patrols are helping to curb the destruction of the huge forest. Another ranger shows off a small cage of weapons and recovered tusks, a sure sign that they're slowly succeeding. The Okapis have survived the turmoil in the chaotic Central African country, but whether they will survive this new invasion remains to be seen. From the air, the forest appears to extend largely untouched as far as the eye can see. But closer to the ground, humans are using the forest for wealth, while destroying the environment for the animals. Here at the London Zoo, an international campaign is on to save one of the most mystical and mysterious creatures of the oceans, the seahorse. They're the stuff of legends, but pollution, habitat destruction and low birth rate mean seahorses have been placed on the vulnerable list. One species has been classified as endangered. The seahorse has a very unusual breeding ritual, with the male and female forming a bond that has them sticking together for life. 
They reinforce this every morning with a little courtship dance by linking their tails and swimming through the sea grasses. They are like chameleons with a unique ability to change colour and camouflage into their background. When the female's eggs are ripe, they go into a full mating dance. The female passes the eggs into the male's pouch. It then seals up and the eggs develop into perfect miniature seahorses, all within the protection of the pouch. While most fish spawn millions of eggs, the seahorse will produce as few as 25 young. Seahorses are so fragile that when kept in aquariums, rarely survive. They don't have stomachs and therefore have very specific feeding requirements. Project Seahorse is operating through the UK, Canada, North America, the Philippines and Hong Kong. Biologists will work in local communities re-educating fishermen and other groups in the value of conserving and encouraging dwindling seahorse populations. Other than humans, the only enemy this unique creature has is the crab. Let's make sure we change that so it has a chance to survive. It's a beautiful, crisp morning and the trainers are out for their morning exercise. It's an image that most people around the world can recognise. These stables are very famous in the racing world as the home of The Scepter, who in 1902 won four of the domestic British classics. Now the ancient countryside, close to Stonehenge, looks set to take racehorse training into the 21st century with technology developed by the new stables manager, Dr Jeremy Naylor. He is one of the brains in equine performance and in just a few months his results have attracted owners from around the country. Dr Naylor's first training success came with Daphne's doll, who won a major race just a few months after he set up in business. His new approach combines his skill as a former vet and sports physiologist, using training techniques that are commonly used on human athletes. Special electrodes attached to the horses allow riders to monitor and record the horse's heart rate during training sessions. Analysis of the heart rate response and blood samples taken immediately afterwards is downloaded onto a computer, allowing the doctor to assess how the horse's heart and muscles are performing and modify the training sessions accordingly. His scientific approach of using traditional training methods keeps the horses happy and willing to race while getting the best result out of the animal. Dr Naylor's methods could help produce a rival to Scepter, who was regarded by many as the greatest racehorse of all time. The stables have become a scientific testing environment and so far the results have been so positive that the next champion could only be a gallop away. Still on a horsey theme, maybe these young guys could be the next champions. They are the first test tube foals born in Europe, using a technique that could be used to produce genetically modified horses. The two foals were born as part of a program designed to produce champion show jumping, dressage and eventing horses. They were created by a revolutionary technique where a single sperm is artificially fused with an egg and monitored for 11 days before being placed into a surrogate mother. It is the first time ever that horse embryos have been kept alive so long in the laboratory. Professor Twink Allen of the Equine Fertility Unit says the program could have a variety of benefits. He says that in addition to being able to breed better horses quickly for the top athletes, he can foresee a day when scientists can identify bad genes that might cause disease and eliminate them. The work could help in the conservation of threatened species and make it easier to breed champions. The foals are set to change the sporting world. Whether it becomes acceptable is another question.
Like it or not, this type of technology is here to stay. On a sunny morning off a coastal village in Vietnam, fishermen start a new day feeding lobsters in their pens. In 1992, the industry was small, with around 10 cages. Now, thanks to the research by a scientist, the industry has grown, and there are around 1,000 cages. This growth has helped the local fishermen, who have been working with the scientists to learn all about breeding lobsters. Lobsters are crustaceans and come from one of two groups, one with large claws, the other with none. 